Would you like to learn some basic cloud networking? Would you like to learn how to connect your organization to the cloud? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Michael Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Careers, and I've been an architect now for over 25 years, and a great majority of them have been a network architect. I'm joined here by Mark Malonovich, who's our chief technology officer, a Cisco certified internet expert, and a networking expert. And we're here today to talk to you about connecting to the cloud. Now, if you're going to host your systems in the cloud, you have to be able to reach them. And many of these systems you want to be reached in a private environment, not that scary, insecure internet. And in order to do that, we need some wide area network connectivity or a connection from your data center or your organization to the cloud. And because it's gonna be over a long distance, it's gonna be considered a wide area network. And we really have four options for our wide area networks and each one of them has their strengths and weaknesses. And anytime you're working in network engineering or, or in cloud architecture or network architecture, we have to choose the best option after evaluating all trade-offs. So we're gonna to talk today about private lines or what they're called on the cloud. We'll talk about IPsec VPNs. We'll talk about software defined networking WANs and we'll talk about SASE. And Mark is gonna help us with some of these more complicated and newer options. We're gonna begin with the private line. Mark and I will describe that. When you're dealing with a private line, effectively you're buying a wire from point A to point B. And with AWS, they call it a direct connection. With Azure, they call it an express route, but really is it's a wire. Well, mostly. So the way this wire works is we basically buy a link to the cloud provider's point of presence. And from that point, we take our router, which connects to our router and the cloud provider's point of presence. We get a cable called the cross connect, which connects to the cloud provider's network and then they have a wire effectively that goes back into their systems. Now the word wire is slightly of an exaggeration to simplify things. It's really a pseudo wire, but we're gonna call it a wire. And that's the foundation for a direct connection. And why would we use those connections? Well, if we have a wire that's 10 gigabit per second and we pay for that wire, we are guaranteed to get 10 gigabit a second. We are guaranteed to have to consistent latency, which means high speed connections that are there when you need it and guaranteed. So if it's critical and if it matters, we're gonna use a direct connection. And in many cases, if we're sending a lot of data over that connection, it may even be cheaper to use the direct connection than a VPN, because you have to remember with cloud networking, we pay for everything. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now the next option, which I'll talk about before Mark gets into these more complicated and newer, more modern options, is a VPN. And what really is that? Well, internet access is ubiquitous. It exists everywhere. And if the cloud provider is connected to the internet, and they are, and you're connected to the internet, which most cases you are, you can create a secure tunnel through the internet and make the internet as if it was like a private connection. And what happens, we use IPsec as a protocol, and we use that as a tunneling protocol. And that makes sure a few things that we are who we say we are and the cloud provider is who they say they are, that our data didn't change in transit and that no one can see the data because we use an encryption protocol. And that's an IPsec tunnel. Now, what's good about this? Well, everybody has the internet, so we can set this up pretty quickly. It's not like we need to call our internet service providers and ask them to build us a wire, which can take a few weeks. It's also typically cost effective because you already have an internet connection and the cloud provider has an internet connection. So it's just creating a tunnel. What's the weakness with this? There's always a weakness inherent in every architectural solution. Well, the internet is not guaranteed. And you may have a 10 gigabit connection to the internet, and the cloud provider may have a 10 gigabit connection to the internet, but that doesn't mean that your traffic is guaranteed on the internet. So when we use a VPN, there's no guarantees, which means latency could be little or it could be a lot. We could lose all of our data getting there, unlikely, but it's possible, or all of our data can get through, but we don't know. So with the IPsec VPN, it's inexpensive, assuming you don't use it a lot. And if you use it too much, it can become more expensive than a private line. There's no guarantees whether it comes to bandwidth or latency, but it's there and it's quick and easy to set up. Now, the next option kind of gives us a hybrid. 
It enables us to use the internet and almost get private line performance, and it's called a software-defined WAN. And Mark, why don't you walk us through what is an SD-WAN solution on the top level or a high level, how it works, and the benefits for the organization to use it? Yeah, you, you really made a good point, Mike. It's because of the change in traffic that our network uh, had to deal with, we had to come up with solutions to figure out how do we optimize what we have available to ourselves and how do we, as always, right? Better, faster, cheaper. That's the motto, right? To get that done. So one of the solutions was SD-WAN. What SD-WAN really is, it takes this software defined approach, which just means that we're removing the old fashioned way of focusing on the hardware and the software cycles around the particular hardware and we're decoupling it and virtualizing it so that we can take the intelligence from the individual devices and put it into like an eye in the sky kind of idea. So a centralized solution that can see the entirety of our network. So as you mentioned, we have traffic that goes now to cloud service providers network. We still have to deal with our data centers, our on-premise data centers. We now are dealing with mobile users. We're dealing with remote workers. We're dealing with branch offices and our headquarters. All of this leaves us somewhat blind. And it makes complicated when it comes to our routing decisions on what we're going to do. That's where SD-WAN can help us with. Because this logic, this brain, the smarts of our network is now sitting above our entire network, it can see everything. And based on advanced analytics, it can help us to make the right decisions at the right time. What would be some of those decisions? Well, how do we connect our wide area, our locations together? Generally speaking, as you mentioned, we get private lines, lease lines. They're not the cheapest thing in the world. We try to get something like an MPLS circuit. It might cost us a few thousand dollars to do so. But the problem is here. Most of our applications go where now? They go out towards the internet. They don't backhaul to our data centers. If we were to take that traffic from the internet and try to get it to our central location, our data center, where we can inspect it for traffic in case we have a next generation firewall sitting there with intrusion detection and prevention, and we got URL filtering and uh, inspection of uh, web traffic in general, that's not going to be the most efficient use. SD-WAN can, knows that and sees that and allows us now because it now overlays all the complexity with a single network on top of that. It's a virtual network on top of our existing infrastructure. And because of that, now we can route traffic, we can optimize our traffic, we can use circuits that might be cheaper. We might be able to now use a cheaper internet circuit compared to a very expensive MPLS circuit. And with that comes the intelligence. Now, instead of going from an active and backup scenario where we can only, let's say, use our MPLS, we can now use both of our connections at the same time, or maybe three connections if we have a wireless backup connection as well. So now that brings us with efficient use of our bandwidth, which also lowers our cost. So in that sense, SD-WAN is really a WAN optimization technology. It is not something new. It's been around for a long time, but it's been packed together in a unified package that can help us architects, can help engineers, and can help our organizations be a cost-effective solution to challenges that we are facing because traffic is going to the internet and traffic is also going to our cloud environments. Okay, so Mark, let me try to summarize that. What you're saying is instead of having the routing logic on the routers, and then the router sends them to the internet with no awareness of whether there's going to be traffic or congestion. Now we can have this pie in the sky controller that can look at all the available paths and send the traffic down the right path with the most efficient routing. Is that what we're talking about? That is correct. Yep. Okay. So effectively by doing so, we can avoid traffic or congestion areas and get almost private line like performance with software defined WAN. Is that what you're yep. saying? In a nutshell, yes. And to give some, if people like analogies, I give you this analogy. It used to be that we would read maps and we would try to basically try to figure out where we're going and we would spec out the route where we're going. But since we got GPS, guess what? This is now dynamically done for us based on what's happening in real time on the roads. You know, people like Google Maps, that is one example of GPS. That's what SD-WAN can do to us because it has that holistic view of our network and the data analytics because it is decoupling that intelligence from the individual devices. That makes sense, Mark. So just like a GPS would help us avoid congestion, the SD-WAN solution would do so. 
which and effectively means that internet connections can perform much better if we're going to use them for VPN tunnels. Yeah. And depending on what type of SD-WAN vendor you have, every SD-WAN vendor is a little bit different. Some of them have additional features on trying to correct packet loss. Some have WAN optimization or WAN acceleration built into them. That is going to be specific to the vendor. But in general, what SD-WAN allows us to do is to optimize our WAN experience. And it's based now with a sole focus on our application traffic instead of worrying about just how we get there based on the general network design. OK, so would you say that our SD-WAN solution gives us closer to private line performance, may not be quite as good as the private line, but it could be as good as the private line. It could give us better performance than the VPN at a cost lower than the average private line. That is definitely true. I would say 99% of the times that is true. Some solutions, again, do better than others. But generally speaking, yes, you can get pretty close to line uh, line speed. To the okay, I love that. So for everybody that's here, we've got at the top in terms of performance is going to be our private line. Correct. Next, we would have our SD-WAN. And then after that, we would have our VPN. But now we get into some really cool solutions, which is SASE, or Secure Access or Secure Edge which gives us some WAN optimization. It gives us some security, especially when we don't know where the users are come from, coming from. They could be all over. So this gets pretty exciting as we start talking about cloud connectivity. So Mark, could you describe what is SASE? And then we'll talk about how SASE works and the benefits it can provide the company. So SASE is really a framework of things. It tries right. to bring together networking and security. Because just like networking was impacted by the shift of traffic going into the cloud and internet, so was our security. It was very difficult to start trying to keep track of where our devices are from, what policies should they have. So with the SASE framework, it uses SD-WAN as a connectivity option. That's going to be our network as a service function. And then it ties in our security piece, which would be firewalls, or next generation firewalls. It could be DNS inspections. We could also be using uh, web inspections, such as security uh, gateway brokers, or when it comes to our cloud applications, we can also use cloud-based security brokers. And all this framework really tries to bring about is a cloud-native networking and security solution in one unified uh, framework, you might say. Not platform, because platforms can vary, but that's the behind SASE. And what's really cool about SASE in general is it takes the guesswork out of how something is supposed to be done in regards to the network. Because generally speaking, it, it, the, the idea behind it is nothing new. You and I, we've been doing this for years. We would spin up a WAN connection, then we would put a next generation firewall on it. Our next generation firewall might have intrusion prevention, intrusion detection system. We have done that. But all these systems have different brains on how they function. So it becomes overly complicated on trying to manage that. So our operational expense comes up, and guess what? We need to invest money in trying to get this hardware. Since this is virtualized technology, or the framework is, and then we bring in a virtual technology, our operational expense goes down because now we're trying to standardize this idea of what networking means, security means, and how we bring it together. And of course, our capital expenditure goes down, guess what? Because it's not hardware-centric. We don't have to worry about buying vendor-specific hardware to get that solution working. So that's why SASE is really fantastic because it brings the best of both worlds together and at the same time saves us money and also brings down all operational expense and complexity. So effectively, it's giving us a standardized way and we can use wherever the user is coming from. It's standardizing our security around standardized tools. So we don't need four times the people that to manage different security tools across data centers and clouds. And it does so in a better, faster, and for the most part, cheaper manner while elevating security. Correct. Yeah. And it's based on services. So a SASE vendor might only have two out of three of these services. It doesn't have to have them all. But the key really around this is that we're going away from the hardware centric to the software and we're basing this all on policy. So meaning if we have remote workers, we're not worried of trying to tunnel them back to a firewall, having to buy security. Why? Because when they connect to the platform that is our SASE platform, that policy is based on the user itself. It travels wherever they go. And when it comes to the cloud, that is really important because we can spin up and spin down workloads in a matter of minutes. How are we going to apply security to that? 
Nobody's going to sit there manually and do it. So having something that's policy based, that has real time analytics based on the WAN optimization and then the security optimization, because you're going to have monitoring when it comes to all of this, that is going to simplify everything. There's nothing that we humanly can do as, as if you think about it as an engineer, engineers can't keep up with that. Wow. So that's where it really comes in having that type of system in place. This doesn't mean engineers go away, of course, no. but the complexity of these things, trying to manage them all at one time, that does get diminished. And that's really also one of the key driving factors why SASE is such a great framework to have in mind. Yeah, and if you think about it, it reduces the number of people that are needed. It reduces yeah. the complexity of their jobs. So it makes things in a, in much, again, going back to better, faster, and cheaper. So I like to summarize this. We have our old fashioned WAN, we purchase it, and you're basically mm -hmm. buying a wire. And whether you call it an express route or a direct connection, it's the private lines we've been using effectively for decades. We have our IPsec VPNs, which basically we've been using for the last 20 or so years. And basically you connect to the internet and you tunnel through the internet and the tunneling and all the routing is done on the routers and the routing logic. Then we get into our SD-WAN solution which now we've got this pie in the sky traffic director that's much like a GPS that's sending our traffic through the internet in an efficient manner, avoiding congestion, effectively enabling the internet to give us private line like performance or close to it at a cost that's much less. And now we get into SASE, which is pretty much an SD-WAN solution, but we're now adding security, we're now adding firewalls to the solution, and we're enabling users to come in for wherever they're at in the world making it much simpler, giving us close to private line performance and a, a fashion that's going to scale, be easier to manage, and will typically be lower cost than private lines everywhere, or VPN concentrators sitting there everywhere with a large team of network engineers. Correct. So there you have it. You now know all the forms of connections to the cloud. And now you know which one to choose and when you need it and when you need it most. Mark, thank you for sharing some of your networking expertise with our community. My uh, Mark is our chief technology officer. He's also a CCIA. I am a CCI as well, but I don't like to talk about it because my number is 7417, which shows how many years I've actually been having fun in the networking world. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like. Please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to be notified of more videos just like this to help you in your cloud computing career. Thanks so much, Mark. You're welcome.